firearm would become such a valued instrument of personal protection and such an integral component of the warrior identity, it would come to be known as the soul of the samurai. The attempted Mongol invasions of Japan in the 13th century had a late developing but far-reaching impact on the political stability of the island nation. These events ultimately helped bring about a period of strife that came to be known as the age of the country at war, Japan's great civil war. In this tumultuous era, individual samurai took on greater importance than ever before. Samurai didn't fight for free. They expected rewards for their efforts. After all, weapons, armor, horses, and servants were expensive. Every act required compensation. And if there was an obligation, it was for lords to adequately compensate their followers. A lord that was too stingy could not garner enough support, and the warriors would leave him. Rewards usually came in the form of parcels of captured enemy territory. But there were no newly conquered lands to be had at the end of the Mongol invasions. Indeed, there was no plunder at all. Many powerful warlords had gone to great expense to defend the country, and neither the shogun nor the imperial court offered any compensation. Resentment grew, and eventually many warlords decided that since there wasn't much reward in serving the organized government, they would do as they pleased. By the late 1400s, power had shifted into the hands of a group of major regional landowners and warlords called daimyo. When you literally translate that term, it means great name. It just means great person. And it emerges in the 1400s and really the 1500s as a title warlords give themselves. Prior to this, these influential men were happy using titles given to them by the imperial court or by the shoguns. But those days were past. You're a daimyo pretty much because you call yourself a daimyo. So it really marks the decentralization of authority that happens in the 1400s and 1500s. People aren't looking to central authority anymore to say, you get to command men. You get to command men, and you get a title because thousands of men follow you. That's good enough. The daimyo essentially became independent rulers of small autonomous states, each one trying to swallow up his neighbors. Japan entered a state of almost constant civil war that would last for nearly 100 years and affect virtually every citizen. At the top of the social hierarchy, brother battled brother. Sons tried to depose their fathers. Nephews assassinated their uncles. Nothing seemed to matter if it got in the way of political ascendancy. Even lower-ranking samurai often change sides from fight to fight. If you change sides opportunistically, then you're a traitor. But if you're faced with a threat of death and you don't flinch, and you show that I'm willing to die to defend my lord, I'm willing to die fighting even after my lord is dead, you have this opportunity to say, OK, change sides. It's OK. I knew you were willing to die, but I'm not going to ask that of you. Everyone from farmers to merchants became militarized and could be called to battle for their regional lord at a moment's notice. Even women got into the act. In at least a few instances, women actually donned armor, mounted horses, and charged into the fray. And if you think about it, warfare dominated by mounted archers uh, is not disadvantageous to women at all because they're light, they're agile, um, as long as they have the strength to shoot the bow and arrow, they, they can perform just as well as men. As the number of available combatants increased, a tactical revolution of sorts began to occur. Warlords began to rely less on mounted warriors and more on foot soldiers. The units were made up of peasant troops using yaris, long wooden spears with metal heads, much like English pikes. 
These troops moved on foot and were commanded by disciplined mounted samurai. One thing that's really remarkable about the warriors of Japan is that they were highly literate and they would write down their accounts in battle. And particularly, they write down all their wounds um, and damages suffered uh, in great detail. And I'll give you one example. Um, one warrior actually wrote that um, one of his, his samurai uh, had been shot in the face. An arrow had gone through his jaw and lodged in the chest. An administrator looked at this and then wrote, shallow. I assume it meant the chest, but anyway, yeah, they were very strict, as you could tell. Fighting during this period was certainly brutal. But there were rewards to be had for courageous service. Proving one's service in combat, however, often involved a particularly gruesome practice, enemy headhunting. When warriors fought in battle, they needed physical evidence of their valor. If they would kill someone, they would try to cut off the head. As soon as they had a head, they would just leave the battlefield because they could then present this as proof of their service and demand compensation for their actions. It wasn't long before some warriors got wise and began arriving late to the fight, taking a head from an enemy that was already dead and presenting it for reward. Such fraud led to another strange practice, formal head viewings. As time passed, there's the idea that you could only get credit for the head if it was someone that you had actually killed. And so they started looking very closely to see if this head had been cut off when the person was still alive or from a corpse. As the nature of warfare changed to involve many more troops, being successful became more about logistical skill than tactical prowess. It's being able to govern an area, extract revenue, extract men, incorporate them into large armies, supply them with pikes. Large-scale warfare also led to a surge in castle building. From 1550 to 1600, dozens were built. The typical design looked much like a castle of medieval Europe, with a central tower or keep at the center of a compound and surrounded by massive stone walls and a moat. Some castles, like the spectacular structure that still stands today at Himeji, just east of Osaka, Japan, incorporated architectural features that could present nasty surprises to unwitting attackers. You enter a castle thinking you're taking the most direct route to the castle keep where you'll get the enemy daimyo, and you wind up running into a blind alley, and then you find that these steep walls on either sides of you have hatchways or doors that open and people can shoot at you, they can drop boiling oil at you, and this, even strolling through with a tour guide, it's scary. Yet even in this age of big armies and massive fortresses, the traditional samurai spirit of the lone warrior fighting his enemy face to face was still not completely extinguished. Legend has it that two rival daimyo, Uesugi Kenshin and Takeda Shingen, once engaged in brief hand-to-hand -hand combat. Takeda and Uesugi were roughly the same age and were two of the best commanders and administrators of the period. They also happened to live on each other's borders, which made them career-long rivals. They fought a series of battles, four in fact, at exactly the same site, year after year after year, a, a small island called Kawanakajima that sits right between their two domains. Most of those were more or less chess piece type battles where they drop lines, kind of maneuver around each other and, and then go home uh, with very little shooting down. However, one battle between the armies of these two daimyo was actually quite bloody. Supposedly, at some point during this battle, in all the confusion, Takeda Shingen, who was sitting behind lines directing troops, found himself cut off from his own bodyguard. And Uesugi Kenshin and his immediate guard had managed to, to penetrate the Takeda lines to get in close to, uh, to Shingen. So supposedly, Kenshin came riding at uh, Shingen sword drawn and tried to slash at him and uh, Shingen who was sitting in a chair at the time then blocked the sword strike with his war fan, his uh, baton essentially. By the time Kenshi could wheel his horse around for another strike, Shingen's bodyguard was rejoining him and he decided that, that he had to leave. While this story suggests an enduring hatred between these two warlords, another tale suggests that years of rivalry may have evolved into a mild fondness between the two. 
No medieval army could function without one of the most basic natural resources, salt.